it's an honor to be with you today to honor our dear friend. And I hope to introduce you not only to the course of his noble and honorable life, but to share with you some of his lasting legacy. And the reason is I hope that you will be inspired, as Kofi mentioned, to draw on his life's work to realize a shared vision of a continent of people who are free, who are prosperous, who are at peace, who enjoy dignity, and who are proud of their histories and proud of their accomplishments and justifiably hopeful about their futures. Professor George B. Ayite was born on October 13, 1945, in Ghana. He graduated from school and received a Bachelor of Science degree in economics from the University of Ghana. Then he went for graduate studies to Canada, received his MA at the University of Western Ontario, and his doctorate in economic science from the University of Manitoba. He taught in Canada and the, and the United States, and he retired as professor of economics after many of years of being a beloved teacher at the American University in Washington, DC. I first corresponded with George in the 1980s when I was ed editing an academic journal at George Mason University in the United States. And he submitted an essay for publication it was really eye-opening. The title was African Peasants and the Market System. And I learned so much from that paper and from the ensuing correspondence and friendship that we developed. George was a scholar, he was a teacher, and he was a forceful public advocate for the cause of African liberty, dignity, peace, and prosperity. There's not too much to say that George lived for Africa. He lived for Africa's promise. He also became a dear personal friend. He was a great student of African institutions. Kofi has talked about some of this history, which unfortunately is rarely known by the descendants of the people who created that history. And he wanted people to understand and share in that heritage. They had been solving their own problems for thousands of years before Europeans, Turks, and Arabs showed up and began to enslave and dominate them. When George Ite was a research scholar at Stanford University in California, he buried himself in the library. He was a voracious reader. And he read up on everything about African history that he could get. And the result was a remarkable book, Indigenous African Institutions. I highly recommend it. Unfortunately, it's hard to get and a bit of a collector's item. But I am encouraging a publisher in the United States to reissue this uh, with additional material uh, from George that wasn't in this edition. In the book, he examined the institutions of law and governance, property and exchange, arbitration and peacemaking, by which African people had solved their own problems. And those institutions still exist, but they are often submerged under the bureaucracy and the sheer violence that was left by the colonial powers. In many cases, the indigenous institutions that still exist are denigrated, and you hear this language, backward or primitive, when in fact they are parallel to and share the same principles as institutions developed in Europe and Asia and elsewhere. People sometimes scoff at the customary laws in African nations, and they say, oh, look at the English common law. The English common law is the customary law of the English people. It's customary law. Or look at the Roman law. The Roman law is the customary law of the Roman people. There's nothing unusual about that. Every nation, every society develops its own customary law. 
In the paper that I published in 1988, George described savings clubs, family pots, institutions known as tontines and other names in the literature, susu is one example, by which people accumulate capital for the purpose of funding business enterprises, capital investments, and much more. He then noted that when foreign officials come to Africa and they observe this, if they bother to notice at all, they refer to them as primitive accumulation. And then George added with a wink, he had quite a sense of humor and you could feel him winking at you. He said, so these are called primitive accumulation in Africa. In the United States, they're known as savings and loan associations. And you find them on the street corners of every American town. And they are identical in functioning. George's last book, which he worked on and published just before he left us, is authentically brilliant. And I want to share this book with you, Applied Economics for Africa. He spent years in the writing of this book. He traveled the length and breadth of this continent to gather examples of business, of successful businesses and failed businesses, of successful policies and failed policies. And every single example is an African example. Now think about the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis or the Bank of England or anything like that. But the principles of economics are universal, as Kofi mentioned. But they are applied within African contexts made much more legible. Now, I'm going to add one other thing. You can get this book pretty easy. George was an economist, and if I said the book is free, he would wag his finger at me and say, Tom, you know better. Nothing is free. The price is zero. That's the correct way to describe it. It has zero price. So if you want to go online, and I hope you write this down, African Liberty, one word, African Liberty, dot O-R-G, and then forward slash Applied Economics. And the whole book is there for you. George wanted this book to be a Creative Commons copyright, which means you can download it, you can print it, you can share it. And it was his gift to all of us. His gift to us. So I encourage you to go and get it. Now, it has been lauded by top economists who read it and appreciated it. For example, two winners of the Nobel Prize in Economics who read the book, Professor Thomas Sargent, Nobel Prize winner from New York University, he wrote, Applied Economics is Africa's economic story, a powerful introduction to the practice of market economics. The theory is economically beautiful, but all the more so because it is proved so around the world, and may have proved so in Africa as well. Another Nobel Prize winner, Vernon Smith from Chapman University wrote, this is African economics for Africans written by an African. The principles it teaches are universal and profoundly important. What makes the book special, a winner, is its simplicity and clarity of style, abundantly illustrated in African contexts. Applied economics for Africa is a winner. And Professor Jeffrey Myron of Harvard University said the book is essential reading for anyone interested in economic development, whether it's in Africa or anywhere else. So I really recommend this book quite highly. It's a great achievement and a capstone to a career of scholarship, teaching, writing, explaining, and speaking truth to power, which is very much what George was about. He was not afraid of other people. He was not afraid of dictators or generals. His office was firebombed. He was threatened with death repeatedly. And he said, your threats to kill me do not invalidate what I am saying. It's still true. And that's why you want to kill me. <laughs>
because I'm willing to speak the truth to you. He opened the eyes of so many people and myself among them. He taught us to see beyond the stereotypes of African achievement that have been promulgated by ideologues who impose crudely understood foreign patterns on African development by foreign aid agencies that deny agency to Africans. They deny their agency. And by political officials, generals, and dictators who ignore and stamp out the voices of African people. What do they have in common? They don't see African people as active, as working, thinking, dreaming, innovating, self-directing people. My Nigerian friend, Olamayawa Okedaran, who was also very much influenced by Professor Iide, put it very neatly in an essay he wrote a few years ago. He says, a typical African city is a huge marketplace. A visit to Lagos in Nigeria exposes the enterprising nature of Nigerians. The city is a bustling hub of entrepreneurship. The young man sweating in the streets, hawking ready-to-eat snacks, the lad advertising cold bottles of table water, the bus conductor calling passengers to his vehicle, or the farmer in the nearby village going to till his melon farm with his family. These are the self-directed activities of individuals with the anticipation of profit. And he concluded, this is the Africa I know. But too few people see Africa that way. And I'm sad to say, too few Africans open their eyes to the reality of African agency around them. George Ete was convinced of the reality of agency for African people. It was not just a hope, it was a conviction based on observation. And you find it eminently described in the book Applied Economics for Africa. Africans can and will prosper. The African century has already dawned. It will only be realized if Africans stop trying to copy every detail of foreign patterns, and instead draw on their own history. Kofi was so right, Professor Bento. Learn your history of your own society. The English learned the history of their common law as their customary law. Well, you could read John Mensa Sarba's history of Fanti customary law. There's customary law and scholarship of that in the African context. Here's an example that George gave us that, again, was very jolting. He compared the rituals of African customary kingship, the stooling of the king, and so on. And he compared it with the Japanese. Japan is one of the world's richest and most modern economies. Here's his description about Emperor Akihito becoming emperor in 1990. Before ascending to the throne, Emperor Akihito, the 125th emperor in a dynasty that traces its roots to the 7th century, performed a solitary all-night vigil of prayers to his divine ancestress, the goddess Amaterasu, that's the goddess of the sun, in each of two thatched roof structures. He prayed for peace and abundant harvests. Then, wearing white silk and a feathered headdress, Akihito dished out food for his numerous guests, made up of J Japan's eight million kami, or gods. There are eight million gods in the Japanese religion. Afterwards, he retreated behind a screen where the spirit of the sun goddess invited him to enter. And when he emerged, according to Japanese Shinto belief, he was no longer an ordinary human, but an arahito gami, or a living god the living embodiment of Nigini no Mikoto, which is the god of the ripened rice plant and the newly deified emperor of Japan. That's how the Japanese treat and create their emperor. Then he continued, African scholars and leaders may note that Japan, an economic superpower, did not have to renounce its ancient Shinto beliefs in order to become a superpower. 
They did not have to become westernized. They were still Japanese with their traditional views, but they could become world leader in electronics and automobiles and so many other areas. So modernization does not have to mean westernization or Asianization. It does not require abandoning traditional culture. Rather, what is needed is to modernize by realizing modern Africanization. African modernization or modern Africanization is the route to prosperity and liberty. Economic development, as it was described by some economists, they said it's building factories. Because they looked at it, they said, look, those rich countries have factories. Aha, build factories and you'll become rich. This was tried in a number of countries and it was a catastrophe, primary among them. It was a kind of a cargo cult. That is to say, we'll build the factories and hope that prosperity will come. But it wasn't driven by the market. It was a disaster because they suppressed the market. And that meant there's no connection between the demand of the consumers and the productive activity. And the consequence was poverty, tyranny, and ultimately collapse. Nonetheless, this model persisted in the minds of the so-called development economists. Ah, what you need is a big factory. And the stinkier and the noisier, the better. That will make you rich. Well, Africa has a lot of those old rusting factories, and it didn't make the continent rich. They were a waste. Instead, economic development, as George stressed, this is a key insight, it's about raising the ability of any person in the society picked at random to consume more, to have a better life, to have better health care, to be able to raise your children, to go to better schools, to live longer, to have a nicer house, to have air conditioning in a hot place and heating in a cold place, to have more nutritious food, to travel and see the world. That's what economic development is. It's not about factories. Factories may create economic development, but that's not what economic development is just as a hammer is not a house. You use a hammer to make a house, but you can't live in your hammer. They're different things. Unfortunately, in Africa, rural populations have been almost excluded from this consideration. And African rulers have persistently preferred urban populations over their rural cousins. That means that they have ignored great sources of development, which is rural Africa and the wisdom and the talent of millions and millions of people, which are ignored in the process. So Lenin had this myth that if you just build the factories and kill off the peasants, that was the other side of the process, they starved in the Soviet Union to death millions of people by confiscating their food. We'll say, we'll sell this food for machines to build factories. It's a worthy trade-off in a dictator's view. Kill off five million people and build some factories. The consequence was a catastrophe. They didn't realize agriculture is also a source of wealth. It's a very important source of wealth. Let's take New Zealand. New Zealand is a very rich country. How did they get rich? Was it because they had state-sponsored factories? Actually, they tried that from the 1950s to the 1970s. It was a disaster. It became the poorest Anglo-Saxon country in the world. Total disaster, so-called import substitution, restrictions on imports, subsidies to factories. And finally, in the 1980s, they said, this is a failure, let's get rid of it. And they opened their market. They freed the market and got rid of all these restrictions and imports and trade. Now, what are their exports? 
30.4% of New Zealand exports are made up of dairy, eggs, and honey. 14.3% is meat. 7.6% is wood. Fruits and nuts are 5.6%. Beverages, spirits, and vinegar, 3.7%. Starches, glues, and enzymes, 3.6%. Cereal and milk preparations, 3.5%. Fish, 2.6%. You heard any machines on that? Well, now we get finally to number nine. Machinery, including computers, 2.6%. They've become rich by being very good at exporting agricultural goods. Fruit, nuts, wood, meat, beverages, honey, eggs, and milk. So there's nothing that says you can only get rich from having a factory. The reason is exporting eggs and honey creates wealth just as surely as exporting automobiles and tractors. Think about it. A hundred CDs worth of eggs or honey or a hundred CDs worth of automobiles and tractors is a hundred CDs. It's value that matters. Now indulge me in a thought experiment for a moment. Imagine a really poor country. So in your mind, paint a picture of this country. Indoor plumbing, that's water coming into your house, is a luxury of the rich. More than one out of four children, 28%, will die before the age of five. 43% of those 10 years in age, 10 years of age and older, work in agriculture in growing food. 10% of the working population, 10 years or older, work as servants in the houses of the people who are rich in that society. No one has a cell phone, not a television or a radio. The average life expectancy is 44. That's 16 years less than Democratic Republic of the Congo, one of the poorest countries in Africa. What country is that? That's the country my grandparents were born in, in the year 1890. At the time, one of the richest countries in the world, and still one of the richest. But in 1890, the standard of living was less than that of the average African, by far. How many of you here have cell phones? Come on, how many of you own a cell phone? Okay. Basically, everybody has a cell phone. My grandparents didn't have a phone. When they finally got a phone, it was the one on the wall. I remember the boy went to uh, talk to someone. They didn't have indoor plumbing. When I was a little boy visiting my grandparents, we went to the outhouse. Okay? So what's the difference between their lives and ours? What made that Change because that's economic development, the ability to live better. What made that possible? Well, George Aite saw it was innovation and exchange. And the innovation, that is to say, a car isn't just another horse. The internal combustion engine was an innovation. Henry Ford didn't just make a faster horse. He did something different. Thomas Alva Edison, who came up with incandescent lighting, he didn't just make a better candle. He did something different. He innovated. Where did that take place? In the very sector that is so despised and denigrated in Africa, the informal sector. Thomas Edison worked in his garage working on that light bulb. Henry stable, figuring out how to make the engines work. Apple computer was started, many years later then, in a garage by some young people who said, why don't we try this? And all the established institutions said, no, that's not possible. The head of IBM, International Business Machines, one of the biggest companies in the world, they invented the first big 
electronic computers, they were as big as this building. They were huge, using these cards, punch cards, to calculate. And the head of IBM was asked the question, someone said, do you see maybe someday people will have a computer in their house? And he laughed, he said, of course not. What would you do with a computer? That's stupid. And so, IBM did not go into the personal computer business. Uh oh, they lost a lot of money. Because it was those upstarts of the informal sector who said, you know, maybe, maybe you could have a computer in your house. Now, you have a computer in your pocket. And that happened in the informal sector. As he pointed out, Henry Ford did start by setting up a big corporation with a stellar direct and a listing on the New York Stock Exchange. He started out in a garage, small experiments, testing small internal combustion engines in the informal sector, which IBM didn't observe. They solved problems. And above all, they solved the problems of the majority of the society who are poor, rather than by catering to the already powerful and wealthy. You don't get rich in this world by making beautiful jewelry for the wife of the president. You get super rich by making stuff that poor people can buy. And all of the great fortunes. Henry Ford was not the only automobile manufacturer. There are automobile manufacturers who made bespoke cars, beautiful, gorgeous, amazing, expensive. He said, I want to make a car that a normal person working on a normal salary can buy. That was the Model T car. First mass-produced automobile. And he made his money by selling cars to poor people, not to the super rich. And we can go down the list. All the great fortunes are made that way. So George suggested, yes, adapt from abroad what works abroad. Why not? Everyone does that. The history of humanity is migration. I would add one more thing to what Kofi said. Copy. It's also copy. So copy what works abroad, but don't discard what works locally. This was his deep insight. Don't throw away what works at home. George Ede saw the harm in destroying uh, traditional structures. The heirs of the colonial states that were imposed by foreign powers filled all the space of the colonial power. They said, all that power is mine now. And they turned their backs on their own heritages. Despite claiming to be anti-colonial, they inhabited the colonial structures and continued effectively to wage war on indigenous structures. Kofi mentioned how kings could be destooled, removed from power for abuse. Not many African presidents have been removed from power. But traditional African governance was checked and balanced and required the consent of the people because they didn't have a big army to massacre their critics. George Gite addressed that neatly. He said, we should look to the traditional chieftaincy, chieftaincy system, which has been denigrated often as old-fashioned, backward, and so on. But he said, this is rooted in the traditions of the people. Modernize it. Okay. Let it be modern Africanization. But don't suppress it in favor of importing a legal system that doesn't work very well in many cases. A friend of mine from Nigeria once put it very neatly. He spent many years in Zimbabwe. He witnessed what Robert Mugabe had done there. And he said something Africans understand. But it made me think when I heard it. It was so shocking. He said, if Robert Mugabe, by the way, who killed thousands of Zimbabweans, they massacred them in, in the Belle Island and destroyed the economy, he said, if Mugabe had wanted to help his people, he could have become a king instead of president. That's an African insight that foreigners have to struggle to understand. A king can be destooled. Mugabe, as president, could not be. He died in his bed after many years of power and stealing. <laughs> so democracy is rooted in African traditions because democracy isn't just we all vote 
and 51% of us say we're going to kill the 49%. That's not democracy. Democracy is fundamentally governed by, by discussion. That's the key to democracy. It's governed by discussion. Parliament means the place where people talk, not the place where people kill other people. The place where they talk. And Africans are accustomed to talking. They're great talkers. The village councils are about talking. All those advisors around the chief or the king are talking and giving advice. That's a bad idea. Don't do that. This would be the way to go. And then other people disagree. So traditional African governance systems were accountable. How much better if they had been allowed to evolve, solve the problems of the modern world rather than being suppressed by military conquest? But that's not what happened. We cannot undo the past, but there is no reason to perpetuate these bad policies and continue to denigrate African institutions that solve local problems pretty well. I'll take one simple example and conclude in Côte d'Ivoire. Hundreds of millions of euros have been spent by the World Bank and other organizations to create titling for land. 1998, the uh, parliament made a law. Within 10 years, 100% of all land will have title. 20 years later, how far had they advanced to that goal? 4%. Not 100%. They're only 96% short. 10 years after their deadline. Something wasn't working. And the reason was they would bring in French civil code, but that's not what the villagers used. They had their own customary law. The Audace Institute in Côte d'Ivoire said, let's do something different. Let's listen to the people and their law. But they did modernize it. They brought in GPS technology. So you ask a farmer, not how many hectares do you have. Farmers are sure about that sometimes. They say, will you walk your land with the GPS? You walk the land, come to here, farmer knows where the land ends and starts, and now you have a perfect map that then clicks with all the maps of all the other farmers, and it can be recorded. Then, village by village, because sometimes customary law will vary from region to region, they created title registries in those villages, administered by the people, not in the distant bureaucracy by French-speaking bureaucrats, but by the people who live in that village. And the consequence has been hundreds of thousands of titles issued and valued by people. So now I have the title to the land, I can get a bank loan on it. It's collateral. I can exchange it for other land, and so on. The use of savings clubs, family pots, tantin, susu, and other systems to accumulate capital is also very important. Allow those to have a legal existence. Let them be modernized. Let it be modern Africanization. There's no reason to think that a bank has to have a granite building. Just because in the village, the bank there doesn't have a granite building. It's around a table as people come and pool their resources. So draw on Africa's own indigenous institutions to solve African problems. I'll mention a book that a colleague and, a, and I wrote called Development with Dignity, which you can also get at zero price if you Google the name. My name, Palmer, and Development with Dignity, you can download the book. And we were very much influenced by George Ite and his opposition to dictatorship. We looked at the data. All the dictators say, I have the plan. Follow me and the country will prosper. So we said, well, we now have a lot of data on this. And it's not true. Dictatorships destroy their countries. Democratic systems that have freedom of speech have long-term stable growth rates. Democracy is development. It's not in opposition to it. So in conclusion, I hope you'll be inspired, as I have been by the work of Professor George B. N. Ayite, pioneer, visionary, scholar, and friend. I miss him very, very much. I wish he were here with us now.
He left us on January 22nd of last year, but his works remain. And through them, you be, may become acquainted with the insights of a great champion of Africa. I encourage you to visit AfricanLiberty.org and download this book. It's a top-rate, a top-notch economics book. And you too can be inspired by George's work. And as he would sincerely hope, and exactly what Kofi Bentel said, it's as if he had read my mind, George would want you to go beyond it and do better. To add to it, to generate new understandings, to blaze the way to a free and flourishing Africa, and to make George proud of you. So thank you, George Ite, for inspiring us and teaching us. And thanks to all of you who have attended these talks, because the future of Ghana and of the continent of Africa is in your hands.